Hey guys, give me just a second to get where we need to be. President of the Modern Bureaucracy. It may be coming. There we go. Come on, name it. Okay. This week we're going to talk about the federal bureaucracy. Start off with what is bureaucracy? Bureaucracy is simply the thousands of federal government agencies and institutions that implement, that administer federal laws, federal programs. So these are the agencies that actually put ideas into practice. Where did it come from? Bureaucracy has actually existed ever since we became a nation. In 1789, under the Articles of Confederation, we had three executive departments. These departments were Foreign Affairs, War, and Treasury. This is the beginning of the modern-day cabinet. Once we reached... Once we got rid of the Articles of Confederation and we ratified the Constitution, this idea of bureaucracy, this idea of the cabinet continued. But even back then, Congress realized the importance of letting the president pick his own cabinet members, pick his own department leaders. Why was this? What was so important about letting the president pick them? Trust. He wanted... He needs to be able to pick somebody that he can trust to work with. Now, what is the catch? It was the catch back then. It's still the catch today. The president nominates, but the Senate has to confirm these cabinet members. We started off with three cabinet departments after our discussion about the presidency, hopefully you remember there are many more cabinet departments, so our bureaucracy got bigger. So why? What caused our bureaucracy to grow? Basically, it was the growth of the United States population. It was this westward expansion. We were leaving the East Coast and trying to move into the interior of the United States. Why would that cause bureaucracy to grow? Why would that cause an increase in the size or the number of bureaucratic agencies? Think about it. Do any of you have family that's located out of town, out of state, out of country? How do you talk with them? How do you keep in touch? Technology, phone, internet. There, there are options, email, social media, whatnot. What was the technology back in the early 1800s? Basically, it was pretty non-existent. The only way you could keep in touch with people from another town, another state, another county was mail. Snail mail. You had to actually write a letter. <clears throat> this is what caused the increase in bureaucracy. As we see people leaving the East Coast, moving towards the interior, trying to settle these new towns, these new counties, these new territories. They wanted to keep in touch with family and friends back home on the East Coast. And, you know, family and friends wanted to keep in touch with them. The only way was by mail. Well, Congress realizes this, and Congress is important here, 
because Congress is actually the only one with the authority to open new post offices. So as we move westward, we expand, we start to settle these towns, these counties, these territories. We see Congress recognize the need for these new post offices. So this increases the size of the bureaucracy. Now, this starts around 1816, this westward expansion. The 1820s, we have President Jackson. I've mentioned him before. President Jackson practiced this thing called patronage, or the spoil system. This is you reward a political supporter. You reward them for their support by giving them a government job. Jackson did this very often. So he was always looking for ways to increase his power, to increase the number of political jobs he could give, the number of rewards he could give. It's important to realize at this point that these cabinet heads, these they're called secretaries with one exception, I'll tell you in a few minutes. These cabinet heads serve at the pleasure of the president. They serve until they say, I quit, or until the president says, you're fired. The, the post office was originally under the Department of Treasury. But under President Jackson, he takes it out of the Department of Treasury and he actually elevates it. He actually creates and makes the post office its own cabinet department. The head of the cabinet department is the postmaster general. What does this have to do with anything? Remember, I'm talking about this patronage idea, this spoil system. You're rewarding people for supporting you. The most common thought process is that President Jackson did this so he would have more control over the post office. Think about it. President Jackson goes to the Postmaster General and says, Postmaster General, I see we're opening a new post office in Cleveland, Ohio. I have no idea where. But they're opening, we're opening a new post office. I think John Smith over there, I think my buddy John Smith would make an excellent postmaster for this local post office. What do you think? Why don't you give him the job? What happens if the postmaster general says no? Remember, he serves at the pleasure of the president. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, you're probably right. The Postmaster General says, no, Mr. President. Mr. President says, well, thank you. You're fired. Get out. And they replace you. Comes up to the second Postmaster General. Says, John Smith over there would make a great postmaster for that little, that local post office. What do you say? Well, if the second Postmaster General is smart, they're going to say, Oh, what a wonderful idea. That is, you are so absolutely correct. He would make a wonderful postmaster. Let's offer him the job. Can he start yesterday? So we see this expansion. We see the, the increase in the post office in, in size by creating more post office, more post office workers, but then also by taking it out of the Treasury Department and making it its own this own cabinet department. Well, now we're up to four. Are there more than four cabinet departments? Yeah, slightly. So I want to go ahead and talk about the increase, the next increase. We see our next increase in the size of the federal bureaucracy about the middle of the 1800s, a little bit, a little bit more than 1850. What happens in U.S. history, mid-1800s? Civil War. We see that wars help our bureaucracy grow. You have to realize that for the first two years of the war, the North was losing. They weren't doing very well. How come? Simple little thing called logistics. The... The North didn't know how to coordinate supplies. 
material. The North couldn't make sure all of their troops were supplied in a timely and reasonable manner. Too many people were trying to do the job, lack of technology, lack of communication. So you may have three people in three different areas trying to feed three different armies, and one of them is not sure what the other two are doing. Is this going to lead to effective logistics? No, it's not. So what happens is we see the North create a new department. They create the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Agriculture takes over the logistics for the Northern Army. Now we start having one voice. We start having one small group near each other who can talk to each other, make these decisions, figure out how they're going to supply their troops. Once the North got their logistics problems taken care of, the tide of the battle turns. They start to win. They start to win the Civil War. So Department of Agriculture was first thing. Second reason we see an increase is what do you need to fight a war? I understand you need ammunition. You need guns. You need food. You need uniforms. But above all else, what do you need? You need soldiers. How did we, how do we recruit soldiers? Let's see. This is a civil war. A recruiter comes up to you, says, young man, I'd like to talk to you. We're fighting a war against the South. We're fighting to end slavery. We're fighting to preserve the Union. We would like for you to come fight with us. Chances are you won't return. If you return, you'll probably come back maimed. You'll probably come back missing an appendage or two. Can I count on you to sign up? No, didn't think so. Man, who could turn down that recruiting spill? I love that spill. Well, apparently a lot of people could. What does the military do today? to get people to go join. Because isn't it basically the same thing? You're taking a risk. You're going to go off and you could possibly lose life or limb. So what do they offer to get people to join? That's right. They offer some sort of benefits. Maybe a retirement if you serve 20 plus years. They pay for schooling. They give you an enlistment bonus. Something like that. Well, this idea isn't new. We see that the United States the government actually started doing this, offered, actually offered starting these retirement bonuses or retirement pensions as early as 1789 to our Navy officers. We have what becomes the pension office. We are offering retirement packages to our Navy officers. Well, when the Civil War comes, we start to offer benefits to potential soldiers. You know, come join, come fight the war, and after the war's over, we will offer you this. Well, this was actually enough to get some people, to get a number of people, to register, to fight for the North. They volunteered for the Army. How does this increase bureaucracy? Well, war's over, and suddenly you have all these people that you made promises to, they actually want you to keep their promises. They want you to keep what you offered them. They want you to keep this promise. You're going to give them what you offered them. So this means that suddenly the pension office has many, many more claims than this ever had to deal with. What happens when somebody gets overworked or when there's an overworked agency, overworked, understaffed? Why would this cause the bureaucracy to grow? Easy. You add people. You hire more people to help with the job. So the Civil War, we see the creation or the increase in bureaucracy. If we're talking about the pension office, they actually had to hire more people working for them. So this is how bureaucracy grew then. The, the size of the pension office, the number of the pension office workers 
exploded. We finished the war. Things are going well. The economy is humming along. Late 1860s, 1870s. The 1880s. People start to look around. People, when I say people, I mean us, the regular people, the citizens. We look around at the economy and we say, hey, there might be a problem. I said, hey, and got my cat's attention. Sorry about that, kitten. It seems like businesses are doing too well. Citizens start to suspect that businesses are engaging in price fixing. They're keeping prices artificially high. Why would businesses do this? Make more money. Business, they're there to make a profit. So what do we do? We do what now seems to be our favorite thing to do. We complain. We complain to the government. We complain to Congress. We tell Congress business seems to be doing extremely well at our expense. We would like for you to check this out. So Congress says, okay, and we see Congress create the first independent regulatory commission. An independent regulatory commission, this is an entity outside of a major executive department. So it didn't belong to any of the departments right now. Treasury, War, Foreign Affairs, Department of Agriculture. The first independent regulatory commission created is in 1887. It's called the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, 1887. Their job is just to look at a particular aspect of the economy. Their job is just to study to see if businesses are participating in price fixing, and if so, create laws or help create laws to fix this problem. While this sounds good, this sounds like it's helping the consumer, and it is, it came with, with an issue. The creation of the ICC, of this Interstate Commerce Commission, it shifted the focus of bureaucracy from services to regulation. It shifted the focus of bureaucracy from helping people to try, trying to regulate people to trying to regulate businesses. Once the government goes into regulation, this allows the government to have vast powers over individual and property rights. Okay, this was bureaucracy early on. Let's talk about the modern bureaucracy more recently. Understand bureaucracies. These are the government agencies that they implement these laws. If bureaucracies are agencies, who are the people that actually work for them? What do we call those people? What I'm asking you is, who are bureaucrats? Bureaucrats are unelected people who work for the government in cabinet-level departments and independent agencies. These people create over 2,000 bureaus, divisions, branches, offices, services, and other subunits of the federal government. How many bureaucrats do you think work for the federal government? How many people do you think work for some sort of government agency? The answer might surprise you. The answer might depress you. The answer, there are over 3 million people working for the federal government as bureaucrats. 3 million people. Who do you think the largest government employer is? Who do you think hires most of these bureaucrats? Somebody you deal with on almost a daily basis. It's the post office. The post office is the largest government employer. They have or they've hired over one-fourth 
of all government employees. So they have over 750,000 people working for them. To put this in perspective, there is only one privately owned company that hires more people than that. Any idea what company? It's Walmart. If Walmart has more people, how come when you go in, you can never find anybody to help you? That's a question for another class. Anyway, back to this 3 million bureaucrats. Only about 300,000 workers, only about 300,000 bureaucrats are found in Washington, D.C. So where are the others found? Well, they can be found in various states. They can be found in various countries working for the federal government. I say this because we really need to re-examine our definition of bureaucrat, our, our, our stereotypical idea of bureaucrat. When somebody says bureaucrat, we think of a pencil pusher. We think white collar work. But that's not true. Bureaucrats are people who work for the federal government. I mean, understand, what does the, what does the federal government's workforce look like compared to the private sector, to what we see for private companies? It actually looks a lot like what we find in private companies. Federal workers, these bureaucrats, they can be FBI agents. They can be foreign service officers, forest rangers, computer programmers, security guards, librarians, lawyers, doctors, plumbers. I mean, the federal workforce really does resemble that of what we see in the private workforce. You know, the people, the maintenance people for a building. They're bureaucrats for a federal building. Please don't get me wrong. They're bureaucrats. The janitorial staff for a federal building. They're bureaucrats. Bureaucrats are anybody who work for the federal government. Formal organization. I've told you that there were over 2,000 subunits. These bureaucrats make up over 2,000 subunits of the government. How many bureaucracies, how many agencies exist? One, five, 25, 500, 1,000. Well, if 3 million was depressing, I'm going to depress you again. Pick a number. Congratulations. You may be right. What do I mean when I say that you may be right? We don't know. We do not know how many bureaucracies exist. Don't count them. Maybe we could, but we don't. Instead of counting them, we break these bureaucracies into a formal organization. We see that there are four broad categories in this formal organization. There's four broad categories of bureaucracy. First, cabinet departments. There are 15 cabinet departments. They have the responsibility of conducting broad areas of government operations. Cabinet heads are called secretaries. There is one exception. This exception is the Department of Justice. The head of the Department of Justice is the Attorney General. A secretary is responsible for establishing the department's general policy and overseeing its operations. Cabinet secretaries, these cabinet departments, actually have a very difficult time not in performing their jobs, but in making their boss happy. And I say this because cabinet secretaries 
they actually serve two people. They have to keep two bosses happy. The first one, the president. Why does the secretary have to keep the president happy? The secretary serves at the president's whim. He can say, thank you, you're doing a good job. He can say, you're fired. So you've got to make the president happy. Now, the second master you're serving, or the second group that you're serving, is Congress. If a cabinet department belongs to the executive branch, belongs to to the president, why are they having to worry about Congress? Simply because it is Congress who funds them. Congress provides the money for the agency. The agency doesn't have money. They can't do anything. Congress Congress also has oversight function. They have the ability to check in on the agency. They can call the agency head up to Congress to testify in front of committees, tell them what's what, what's working well, what's not working. Is it working the way Congress intended it to work? So Congress has a lot of a lot of uh, power over them. So cabinet departments have to make both people happy. Next one, independent executive agencies. Independent executive agencies resemble cabinet departments, but they have a more narrow area of responsibility or expertise. These agencies usually perform services instead of regulatory functions. A couple of these agencies would be NASA. It would be the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Independent regulatory commissions. Once again, these are agencies created by Congress. They exist outside the major departments. They regulate a specific economic interest or activity. Understand, economic issues are very complex. They can cross many spheres of influence. So Congress will attempt to create commissions that could develop expertise in certain areas. They're hoping to provide continuity of policy in regards to economic issues because Congress does not have the expertise nor the talent to develop this export expertise. They don't have the experience or the education to deal with this. Some independent regulatory commissions are going to be the National Labor Relations Board, the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Communications Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The last of the four are government corporations. While government corporations have been around for a while, we start to see a big increase in the 1930s. Government corporations, these are simply businesses established by Congress They perform functions that private businesses could, but don't. Think about that. They perform functions that private businesses could, but don't. Why don't these private businesses do it? I mentioned earlier, what is the goal of private business? What are they trying to do? Profit. Make money. They don't perform these functions because they lose money. But if that's the case, why does the federal government step in and create a corporation, subsidize this activity, if it's going to lose money? The answer is simply because we, the people, need this service. We need whatever they're offering. Examples, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. These are the people that 
make sure that if banks go bankrupt, you're going to get at least a portion of your money back. The U.S. Post Office, this is a private corporation. Do they make money? Well, occasionally. Sometimes they do. Once every six or seven years, for the, but for the most part, they lose money. So why does Congress... Why does Congress subsidize this? Why do we still have the post office? Simply because we need it. Amtrak. If you're not from the Northeast, you're probably not going to have any idea what Amtrak is. Amtrak is a railway. People will use it to, to commute from town to town or state to state up in the Northeast. It is still in use. But really, it has fallen out of favor. It is not really needed with everybody having a vehicle or have, being able to afford a, a, a plane flight. But we still got it. There has been a fear since the 1930s that members of the civil service would play a major role in not only implementing legislation, but also electing members of Congress and the president. Why would this be a fear? There is a concern that it's going to give these bureaucrats too much power, too much influence. In an effort to prevent this, we see that Congress created the Political Activities Act of 1939. So this is also called the Hatch Act. This act prohibits federal employees from directly working for political candidates. They can't volunteer time, money. They can't show support for a certain political candidate. Is this extreme? This is the government telling you that if you do this, you're going to be fired. You're going to be punished. People start to say, Hey Congress, there might be a problem. This might be an a, this might be an abuse of First Amendment right, freedom of speech. We have the right to support our politicians that we want to. We have the right to tell people. We have the right to donate money, time, campaign for whatever. Congress says, "Really? You think so? We'll check into it." Congress leaps into action. 64 years later, 1993, Congress says, you're right, we may have overstepped our bounds. So we see a relaxation of the Hatch Act. This new Hatch Act, this revised Hatch Act, this allows federal employees to run for public office in nonpartisan elections. So in local elections, this allows federal employees to contribute money to political organizations. This now allows federal employees to campaign for or against a candidate in partisan elections. Remember, a partisan election, they are party identified. They're going to be running as a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, a Libertarian, whatever. But now, thanks to these relaxed, relaxed hatch rules, we can now support openly whoever we want. What do bureaucracies do? Talked about where they come from. We've talked about bureaucrats, those people who work for them. But what do they do? Main focus is implement. Implement the policy. Implementation. This is simply the process by which a law or a policy is put into operation. We are executing government, or excuse me, executing congressional wishes. That is implementation. Iron triangles. In the good old days, political scientists, they would try to discover what influenced policy decisions. 
they would try to, to research how policy was made. We discovered this thing called an iron triangle. An iron triangle is simply the relationships or the interactions between Congress, the bureaucracy, and something called clientele interest groups. These clientele interest groups, these are the interested groups, these are the people that these laws are going to serve. What happens is clientele interest groups, they tell Congress what they want. Congress listens, says okay, so they pass laws. These laws are given to the bureaucracies, to these agencies, to implement, to put into practice, and these laws in turn, in turn, serve the clientele interest group. So we have clientele interest group, Congress, bureaucracy, back to clientele interest group. This is our iron triangles. So this is the way we used to do it. Well, hold on, hold on, before I go back. What happens once the bureaucracy puts this law into effect, they implement it to serve the, iron, the clientele interest group? Well, then the clientele interest group goes back to Congress, tells Congress the bureaucracy is doing a good job or they're doing a bad job. They tell them what else they would like. Congress passes new laws. They get sent back to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy implements it, and they are now trying to implement these new procedures to serve clientele interest group. So we get this everlasting, this never-ending triangle fixture of work, of communication. Iron triangles were the old way. Now we look at issue networks. Issue networks, we're still studying iron triangles, but we've added things. We've added a few other people that we want to involve in the process. <coughs> first person, or first group we want to add, lawyers or the courts. Why would we want to add the lawyers or the courts into this process? Simple. We want to make sure that the laws we are trying to create are legal, that they are constitutional. What's the point in creating a law if the court's going to say it's unconstitutional? You can't implement it. The second person, the second group we are bringing into this issue network, this new study, academics. Why are we bringing in academics? It's really simple. We're bringing in academics to make sure that our proposed solution, our proposed law, actually affects the problem, actually fixes the issue. What good does it do to pass a law to create a solution if there's not a problem for it to, to fix? So we have to make sure the solution actually fixes the problem. The last group we're bringing in, public relations firms. Why are we bringing in these firms? They're, we're, Congress wants these firms to go to work. They want to get, they want us, the people, to buy into these ideas. How many catchy little slogans can you think of that just are sitting there in your head that have to do with government? Don't drink and drive. Click it or, or tick it. Don't mess with Texas. These are just, they're going to get these PR groups to come in, try and do something to get us to believe in it, to remember it. Interagency councils. Many agencies work towards the same primary goals, but they serve different constituencies. 
To help guide all of these agencies, we have interagency councils. These are groups to facilitate the coordination of policy making and implementation across a number of government agencies. So these are just coordinating bodies. Policy coordinating committees. These are simply sub cabinet level committees. They're created to facilitate interactions between agencies and departments to handle complex policy problems. Reviewing policy. Once Congress passes a bill, the president signs it into law. This new law, is it a hot mess or is it clear and concise? Most of the time, it's a hot mess. Congress has a general idea of what they want to do, but they don't know how to implement it. So they leave it to the executive branch. They leave it to these bureaucrats. Remember we talked about delegated powers under the presidency? This is an example. They leave it to these agencies to decide how it's going to be implemented. So every law, every new bill is going to go through this process. The first step, administrative review. Administrative review is simply a bureaucrat. He will look at this bill that is passed by Congress. They read it. They interpret it. They sit there and say, I think this is what Congress wants to do with this bill. I think this is what they are trying to achieve. What's wrong with this? The bureaucrat may not be on the same page as Congress. He may totally misread the bill and it's not going to be implemented the way Congress wanted. Second step, administrative law. Administrative law, we're going to write the rules, the regulations, the, the procedures to actually implement this bill, to actually start implementing, to, to start this law and have it function well. A good, effective law has good, effective administrative law. It is very well thought out, nitpicky, if you will, but it is the administrative law is very detail oriented. Making agencies accountable. <clears throat> Who are these agencies accountable to? How do we make sure they're doing what they're supposed to? Got some options. First, Executive control. Chief executive, the president, has control over these agencies. Well, I mean, this is true. He does have control. He does appoint the agency heads. But while the president appoints, the Senate has to approve. What happens if the Senate doesn't approve whoever the president's appointing? We now have an agency that doesn't have any leadership. And remember, Congress funds these agencies, not the president. So if Congress decides to cut funding for this agency, there's nothing the president can do. The agency has no money. They cannot work. So there is executive control. It's just not very good. In that case... Let's look at congressional control. Congress can control agencies with the power of the purse. They do fund them. They have oversight, the ability to, to make sure that these agencies are doing what Congress wants. There's a problem with oversight. How many agencies are there? We have no idea, remember? Thousands. Let's be, on, let's be honest. Does Congress have time to provide oversight 
for every federal agency, for every federal bureaucracy. No, they don't. Plus, reverse this. What if the president has to appoint a leader? If they disagree with the leader, they don't confirm. The Senate doesn't confirm them. So this position is, this agency is leaderless. It's not going to be effective. So while we have congressional control, this also doesn't work worth anything. Well, let's talk about judicial control. Judicial control, does our judicial branch, do the courts have any control over the bureaucracy? Kind of. What we see is that when a law is passed on to the bureaucracy, this can happen even before they start to implement it or after they start to implement it. They get sued. There's a question of if this law, if this policy, this procedure is constitutional. So the court will issue a temporary restraining order. This is a temporary halt while the court determines if this new law, this new policy, this new procedure is constitutional. If the court decides it's constitutional, they lift the temporary restraining order, business goes on. Does the court have any power after that? No, it doesn't. Once they've decided the law is constitutional, they're out of luck. They can't control it. If it's un no, remember, if it's unconstitutional, the law cannot be put into effect. So the court can stop it there. But once the law is declared constitutional, it's free to move on. The court runs out of power. Does this work? Mm, not really. So what do we have? How do we make these agencies accountable? What we have, and this is the best out of poor options, is this clientele agency control. Those agencies are the groups that these agencies are trying to serve. Oil and gas companies, transportation, communication, medical, pharmaceuticals, whoever. How do they make agencies accountable? With this clientele group control, the clientele group tells Congress if the bureaucracy, if the agency is doing a good job. What's wrong with that? You think this clientele group might be a little bit biased? What if this agency has to tell them no? Then chances are really good they're going to tell Congress they're not doing a good job. Is this any better? No, but it's the best of what we've got. Recognizing a bureaucracy. We have talked about how bureaucracies are formed. We've talked about what they do. Now I want to discuss how you can recognize one. There are certain signs you can look for. There are certain indications that you are dealing with a bureaucracy. First is size. In regards to a bureaucracy, these agencies, they're going to have many interests, many responsibilities, they are all varied. They're going to need people who specialize in each area of interest. So this means that when it comes to size, bigger is better. When we are talking a bureaucracy, usually a bigger governmental agency indicates that this is a bureaucracy. Is there a minimum number? No. There's not. Is there a maximum number? Once again, no, there's not. But bigger is better. Neutrality. Neutrality can have, well, when it comes to recognizing bureaucracy, it has two definitions. The first is neutrality and benefits. This simply means if somebody comes in, they apply for benefits, 
They qualify for benefits. They receive the benefits. Two people come in, they apply, they qualify, they both get benefits. We cannot turn one away if they qualify simply because we don't like their gender, their race, their religion. We don't like what school they went to, anything like that. Neutrality and benefits, somebody, two people come in, they apply, they qualify, they each get benefits. The second type of neutrality is neutrality in hiring. This is simply when you go apply for a job at one of these agencies, do you have to know somebody to get the job or does everybody who applies have an equal chance? Neutrality in hiring is everybody who applies has an equal chance. This is the way it's supposed to be. Was this always the way it was? Remember my spiel, my talk a few minutes ago about President Jackson and patronage, rewarding people with political jobs. So no, this all, it used to be who you knew, not what you knew. What was the problem with this patronage, with the spoil system? Very often you could get somebody put in a job in a leadership position that they simply weren't qualified for. They didn't have the, the expertise. They didn't have the knowledge on how to do the job. So to combat this, we see these bureaucracies, these agencies, come up with something called the civil service or the merit system. Civil service or merit system, it's a test all prospective employees have to take this test. So everybody who applies takes the test. Could be oral, could be written. You know, some of these are as simple as typing tests and general grammar, punctuation skills, spelling skills, general office skills. The thing about this is this test creates a baseline. If you can pass the test, you have the base qualifications to do this job. You can be competent. Don't happen. Doesn't mean you're going to be good. Means you can be competent in this job. Everybody takes it. What happens to the people who don't pass the test? They don't move on in the hiring process. Thank you for applying. I want to come back to privatization. That's the last thing I want to do. Let's do hierarchy. In a bureaucracy, this government agency, you have what we call a hierarchy. This could be also a chain of command, an organizational chart. This means that you know who leadership is, who is in what position, and they have defined task. If you're at a big four-year university, your organizational chart, your, your chain of command, your hierarchy may look like this. Maybe president on top. Underneath the president, you have various vice presidents. Under the vice presidents, you have various deans. Under the deans, you have assistant deans. Under the assistant deans, you have department heads. Under the department heads, you have the assistant department heads. Then under the, the assistant department heads, you finally have faculty. You have the, the instructors. That would be your chain of command, who you would go up to each level to talk to their boss. Expertise. A bureaucracy, they have expertise. They understand how their decisions are going to affect the clients, but they're also going to affect people outside the clientele interest group. They understand how these decisions are going to affect both, both bodies of the population. Finally, back to privatization, yay or nay. 
there's always some call for government to privatize some service they provide. Government's too wasteful in their spending. A private company could do it better. Should we privatize? Well, honestly, there's pros and cons. You have to understand, though, I asked you earlier, what's the point? This is my third time saying this. What's the goal of a business? Profit. What's the goal of one of these government agencies? They're trying to perform as much as they can. They're trying to accomplish. They're trying to help as much as they can, as many people as they can, given the limited government resources. Now, with these two definitions in mind, helping as many people, giving the limited resources versus making money. If we privatize, what are the pros? Well, the private industry, they may be able to do it more effectively. If there is a problem, they can address it. They can solve it much quicker than the government can. Who actually has more money to throw at this project, the government or private companies? Usually it's private companies. They can do this. This sounds like a good reason. But, on the other hand, the con, if we privatize, can we watch over the private company's shoulders? Can we micromanage? No, we can't. We have given that authority to the company, and they can do it the way they see fit. If we don't like it, well, that's just too bad. We gave up the authority. What if the private company decides they're not making enough money? What if they decide to take shortcuts? Maybe they're going to shortchange. Everybody who qualifies for a benefit isn't going to receive it. This way they make more money. Do we know this? No, we don't. So there are issues in privatization. There are pros and cons. So when the question arises, should we privatize? Man, the answer is simply, that's a personal opinion. I can't tell you. You have to look at it. You have to make up your own mind. Thanks a lot.